shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Proverbs 19.5「Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from York, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today is Sunday afternoon, the 23rd of September 2018 and the year is approaching its uh, Antichrist end uh, with uh, real giant steps, because according to the Antichrist the year, the year ends on the 31st of December and this is just a few weeks from here and uh, of course in the meantime we will have um, canned in all the recordings of this wonderful book reading from Ernest L. Martin, Simon Peter vs. Simon Magus or Simon Peter Meets the Competition. Uh, and today I'm again connected via Skype with my two brothers in Christ, Michael in Germany and um, Brett over there in the United States of America, who will assist me in the reading and commenting of this wonderful work from Ernest L. Martin. Um, there's just one little message I want to give to everybody before I even introduce my two guests today. And that is that I got this uh, book in the very first place from uh, a website that is called seawaves.us. But this seawaves.us has changed its server and so every time when I in the past gave a, um, a link to uh, download this book or anything else that I have from that website, like also the reading of uh, uh, Samuel C. Gipp I did in the time on an understandable history of the Bible that is all linked to seawaves.us. They changed the server and all that information is gone for now. It maybe will be put up in the future again. That is not on my hands. I just want to tell you those you can't get. But um, I found an Arctic beacon on archive.org uh, a download of the same PDF and um, I changed the reference in my PDF so on Arctic Beacon you can find that book when you just type in Simon Peter versus Simon Magus Ernest Martin um, you will be given a few websites where you can download the PDF where, PDF where we are reading from today just to make sure that you can hold your own copy of the book at least electronically Okay, so far to that little introduction, and uh, then I'm going to turn over my word to Michael from Germany. Hello, Michael. How are you? And are you drowning there as much as we are with all the rain today, or how is the weather over there? Yes, hi there. It's the same weather here, actually, and it's also the same as in your place. It's the beginning of autumn today, so it uh, has all the meaning to the the the, 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 um, <laughs> the the rain the rain which is falling is just uh, signal signalizing that it's now the end of the summer and we have now to take care of uh, yeah warmer clothing and scarves and such things but uh, anyway uh, this time of the year together with the winter reminds us that we maybe have to get some more sleep because it's not that uh, bright uh, in the evening and also we got maybe more time to lecture for lectures and uh, to read and to do studies than in the summer so everything's okay here and uh, how's at your place brett everything fine yes yes things are better i had a uh, i had a flood on wednesday was it no 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 thursday night i'm sorry Woke up on Friday to a uh, couple of inches of rain in my basement, so oh. I have to uh, get that taken care of. It's created quite a havoc. So, but other than that, I'm doing just fine. I'm trying to recover from the cold I got on Wednesday too. 
I kicked my blankets off <laughs> and got the uh, sniffles. Let's just call it that. But other than that, I'm doing great. Having a hot cup of water right now. <laughs> Trying to wean myself off coffee a little bit. See if that helps. Well, put so, some ginger in the water. No, I still have yet to go get ginger, Yerk. <laughs> they don't sell it here across the street where I live. Oh, that's a shame. Okay, so At least just... as far as I know, um, they might actually, but uh, I haven't uh, I haven't seen it there. Maybe I haven't looked hard enough, but I kind of doubt it. It just it's kind of more of a you know country grocery store across the street. <laughs> no, but in the country they often have these kind of produce. Anyway, you will just get that later on and then see that the antioxidants of the ginger will uh, help you with getting in order with your health. In the meantime, we are going to continue the reading and we are starting today the 14th reading of uh, the subject that Peter was never in Rome, speaking of the Apostle Peter. Simon Peter versus Simon Magus or, uh, or Simon Peter meets the competition. And we are in the subchapter... Catholic Church accepts Simon Magus's teachings. Very interesting little article that this goes about and uh, I want to remind everybody to go to my playlist of Babylon Mystery Religion where I read the book from Ralph Woodrow that I introduced yesterday to you because we are going to finish this task of uh, teaching that the Apostle Peter never was in Rome with the chapter 10 of that book that I already read when I read the complete book some two or three years ago on my channel. And um, when you read that book, when you follow that reading on my channel also, um, whichever way you prefer, um, you will see that he also spoke about uh, bringing pictures into the teaching of Christianity. And this is what, this is what we are reading now uh, actually going about, at least a little bit when we see uh, this little paragraph here where there comes a quotation from the book Ecclesiastical History, Volume 2, Chapter 1, Section 12, where this is taken from. Uh, this deals a little bit with that and I'm going to tell you what it's all about when we arrive there. But we're going to start on the top with the subject, Catholic Church accepts Simon Magus's teachings and we read, we have the record of history. Well, that's, <laughs> that's a very important part that we today, in 2018, we have a well-written record of history. It is only up to us to find that history, because <laughs> in the Antichrist system that we are living in, we are not given that on a silver platter, are we? Well, depends on where you go. You could go to Georgetown University. What do you expect you're going to get there? <laughs> <laughs> Jesuit history. Yes. Well, the best education ever, huh? Uh, yeah, in Jesuitism. Yeah. But hey, right. the Jesuits are great teachers, aren't they? That's why everybody ah, wants yes, their children to. Ah, yes, and sophistry. <laughs> yeah, that's why everybody wants their children to attend Jesuit schools, yeah, because they yeah, are so wonderful right. teachers, right? Right, and they're so highly regarded by our, our rulers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. All of our rulers have connections to them, of course. We are schools <laughs> <Yes>. or universities <laughs> or whatever kind of connections, but they all are connected in one way or another to the. Jesuitical education system, or should we to rather call whore. it the Catholic indoctrination system? Yeah. Uh, whichever words you use, you are saying the same thing. But anyway. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the author says yeah. we have the record of history, and this is for sure today in 2018, and we should sometimes rely on that and do our own research and see how history records the events that were predicted in the Bible. Because all what we are reading about here is nothing else but we, but what we can also learn from the Bible. But maybe Bible study is too hard for you. You maybe want to do a little bit more secular research. Well, books like these will help you. And then you just have to go to the right sources where you can get the information from the right history records. And then you can go on reading the sentence, which I'm trying now for the third time, that we have the record of history which tells us that Simon's teaching spread like wildfire, especially in Rome, where he was honored as a god. In fact, after going there, he made that city, Rome, his headquarters. 
But let us recall that the followers of Simon called themselves true Christians. Tja, anything changed the last 2000 years? Because the Roman Catholics today also call themselves true Christians, right? Because mm. they think that they are part of the only true church that Jesus Christ founded here on earth. Nothing changed in the run of 2000 years. So be very careful when you speak to someone who calls, calls himself a true Christian. And first of all check if he is a true Christian in the biblical sense or if he is a true Christian in the Catholic sense. Simon steadfastly adhered to this, uh, to calling himself Christian. In fact, it finally became the desired name for his followers to use. The names Simonians and Samaritans began to die out in the second century AD. Justin, and I think this must be Justin Martyr who is talking about, tells us that some were still going by the parent name in his day, and he lived about 152 AD. I think this Justin Martyr was a personal acquaintance of the Apostle John, if I'm not mistaken. But by the time of Oregon, which, or who lived about 220 AD, he states that there were hardly 30 people in the world which went by the parent name. Now the question is how big did he see the world, eh? Yet Eusebius, who lived about a hundred years later, said they were indeed still numerous all over the world. So what kind of a contradiction is that? We get in the beginning of the 3rd century 30 people in the world which went by the name of Simonians or Samaritans and a hundred years later by Eusebius who tells us that there were indeed still numerous all over the world. So how did that all of a sudden happen? One of these two doesn't have his sources right, I say. The fact is, the author continues, they were divorcing themselves, oh, sorry, they were divorce, divorcing themselves. What, what am I reading here today? What is it, English or what? I, I, I can read English, right? The yeah. fact is, they were divorcing themselves from the use of the name Simon or Samaritans, because by the 4th century their names were beginning to have an odious connotation to them. Nonetheless, the Simonians were very much around, this time with the name of quote-unquote Christian. And we have the exact testimony of Eusebius from 325 himself, that these people were flocking into the Catholic Church. It was these people that came into the new quote-unquote um, state religion that Constantine, the Emperor of Rome, proclaimed in 321, when he proclaimed quote-unquote Christianity to be the state religion of the until that moment pagan Roman Empire. Now they needed to fill those churches not only with the up to that moment persecuted real, true, apostolic, Bible-believing, Jesus-following Christians, but also all their pagan counterparts needed to go into that church. So that is the way how Christendom was paganized, by baptizing paganism with Christianity and then getting all the load of all the different sects of Simonians and Samaritans who were actually pagans because their religion is not the basis of the Bible, their religion is the basis of the Talmud and of other Babylonian teachings to come into that same church and to fill that quote-unquote Christianity which now was the state religion of wherever you lived when you were living in the Roman Empire and that Roman Empire was more or less all of known and civilized Europe at that time. Don't forget that. Huh? This is the real starting point in this little sentence that we just read here. We have the exact testimony of Eusebius himself that these people, the Simonites and Samaritans, were flocking into the Catholic Church. That Catholic Church at that time was the new found by, from the top ordered Christianity 
of the pagan Roman Empire. Now notice what Eusebius says after stating that Simon Magus in the days of the Apostles received baptism and feigned Christian belief. Quote, and what is more surprising, the same thing is done even to this day by those who follow his most impure heresy. For they, after the manner of their forefathers, slipping into the church like a pestilential and leprous disease, greatly afflict those, and speaking of a great number of people, into whom they are able to infuse the deadly and terrible poison concealed in themselves. We are speaking of flooding the quote-unquote Christian church with pictures, with idols. This is the point that I wanted to make. Uh, we can read this in Ecclesiastical History, chapter, Volume 2, Chapter 1, Chapter 12. And this is the point that Ralph Woodrow goes a little bit into his work on Babylon mystery religion. You know, people in the time were not that literate as we are today. There were no public schools and education was only for the rich because it was a feudal state. Even Rome was a feudal state. You have the rulers and you have the ruled and in between you had nothing. And the rulers of course could read. But the ruled, most of the time, were illiterate. So how do you teach illiterate persons about Christianity? You cannot show them the Bible, even if you had it, because they weren't able to read it. So they were using pictures. Like today you have this children's Bibles, you know, with a lot of pictures showing the children of the story of Adam and Eve, of the flood, of Moses, the Ten Commandments, the forty years of Israel in the desert, uh, the story of King David, the story of David and Goliath, um, the New Testament, the baptism of Jesus in the River Jordan, the the the, the epistles or, or or the um, yeah the epistles of uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, in colorful uh, pictures here and there, of course, uh, with a little bit writing underneath it. Uh, books like the prophecies of Ezekiel, Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah, and of course uh, the book of Revelation, all in pictures. And these children from these children Bibles learn by the pictures. But what did God say about pictures? And to make a picture or to make a uh, how does he call it there um, make a uh, graven image thank you an image that was the word I was looking for a, an image of anything that is in heaven above that is on the earth beneath or that is in the waters under the earth he said don't do it so how can you learn the true word of God when you are inundated with pictures yeah you even soak in them. And that's what the early quote-unquote Christians did. Not the true Christians, but these early Simonians and Samaritans. They were teaching the people quote-unquote Christianity by using graven images. Pictures they drew in the ground, they, uh, they painted on animal skins or wherever on. And they were telling the people the story of the Bible in pictures. And this is already a sin to do it in this way. So these people are used to see these pictures. So then when they go into a quote-unquote church and they see all those idols standing there, all those graven images standing there, they feel quite at home, right? And that's exactly what God didn't want. If you want to teach someone the Bible, the Word of God, and he cannot read, then just you take the Bible and read it to him. And he has to understand by that. And you can even teach someone writing and reading. But that, of course, takes a lot of effort. And, you know, as it is today in 2018, most people don't want to do any effort. They want everything presented to them on a silver platter without any self-involvement 
in there, any self-engagement in there. And that's the time as it was here in the 4th century too, what we are speaking about here. Eusebius even said it, that Simon Magus in the days of the Apostles received baptism and feigned Christian belief, so he used all these graven images and idols and cartoons or how you can call them, designs, yeah, designing things, pictures, paintings, whatever, and um, using this to teach people of this quote-unquote new sect, what they are called Christianity, which is not a real biblical apostolic true Jesus Christ following Christianity, but which is the apostate belief that even Simon Magus himself adhered to. Yeah? And you can read more about this in the book uh, Babylon Mystery Religion. Just telling you that where you can look that up. Does anybody of uh, my two brothers here maybe have a comment on the things that I was just saying? Or shall I just continue? Yeah, reading? I was just going to add to what you're saying that, uh, <clears throat> you know, with the uh, images and idols is also look at all the statues used. In, in just not only in the church, but also in the secular realm, uh, all of the uh, <clears throat> capital buildings and things like this, it's, it's like you're walking into a Roman church, you know? Yeah. It's about the same thing, only it's uh, temporal and not spiritual. But uh, same principles apply. I mean... Um, this is the type of thing we're not supposed to be yoked up with, right? I mean, spiritually. That's correct. Good. I'm going to continue. This is amazing testimony, the author says, about what Eusebius said here. For Eusebius is telling us that these people were now quote-unquote Christians and that they were corrupting the entire church as a pestilential disease which hits the whole body. Eusebius later maintains that the chief troublemakers were being expelled from the Catholic Church. But how could they expel all of them? Almost the whole church by this time was effected. They needed the pagans to be Christianized. And how do you do that? When you give all the pagan gods Christian names. So Jupiter, J. Jupiter, becomes Peter. Semiramis, the Queen of Heaven, becomes the Virgin Mary. Tammuz becomes Jesus Christ. And so on, and so on, and so on. And all the minor gods just become the quote-unquote saints of the Bible. It is not to be supposed, the author continues to say, that all of the early heretical sects were direct branches of the Simon Magus religion. By the end of the first century, there were at least 50 minor sects. And today in 2018, we have about 30,000 different Protestant denominations, according to Tony Palmer a few years ago, right? Yeah. The Simon Magus group represented several of these sects, but not all of them. The truth is, the Simonians, whose headquarters were at Rome, finally absorbed all these minor sects by the 5th century. Simonism is Roman Catholicism. I always have to add Roman to when, when they write about Catholicism. Because it is Roman Catholicism that is what we have to deal with today. Because all the churches in the ecumenical movement are not being taught that they have to go back to Catholicism. They are taught to go back to Roman Catholicism. And there is quite a little difference. That's why we had that schism in 1054. That's why the Eastern Orthodox Church still struggles to become a part of the Roman Catholic Church. No, Simonism is Roman Catholicism. I think it is quite important to make that little extra remark there. Do you agree with me, Brad? 
Yes, I do. Absolutely right. Me Michael? Too. Me too. Okay. It is also true, the author continues, that even some of the Catholics in Eusebius' time were unwilling to go all the way and accept the Simon Magus doctrines of images, pictures, incantations, etc. But within another hundred years, history shows the bars were let down completely. Again, this little sentence that we just read is confirmation of what I told you before. Simon Magus' doctrine of images, pictures and incantations. Something the Bible forbids in the second commandment. But in Eusebius' day, he even balked at their bringing outright images into the churches and worshipping them. Notice what he finally says of these quote-unquote Christians of Simon. Quote, Simon was the author of all heresy. I think this is an important sentence that we should maybe give a little bit color to spring out that we can really see that. I got a comment, Yerk. Yeah, please do so. Um, you were speaking of incantations. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I had to look that up because I wasn't really familiar with it. In the old uh, 1828 dictionary here, it says, the act of enchanting, enchantment, the act of using certain formulas of words and ceremonies for the purpose of raising spirits. You know, an incantation, Brett, uh, is like you have this uh, Roman Catholic choir singing of Lucifer and the Easter Mass. You remember Ooh. that video? Yes. That's an incantation. There's several of those videos. Yeah, there's several of those from videos. From several different times. I think I have one from 2016 or 2015, I forget. It comes from Canon, Canon you know, incantation. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, yeah it's, it's, it's about singing. It's, it's these, um, well, just uh, watch movies like, uh, if you ever want to watch a movie anyway, uh, like The Name of the Rose, you mm -hmm. know, uh, there you have a lot of these incantations. And, uh, yeah, Concrete. for the purpose of raising spirits, though, that's especially troubling. I mean, um, particularly when you're dealing with uh, a Luciferian spirit, yeah? Yeah, but that's what Roman Catholicism is all about. It sure is. And they but always... it's not directly that way. It's indirectly that way. Yeah, they I mean, need it... the help of the fallen angels, of the demons, to... Perform well, in a way, it miracles. is direct, isn't it? It is direct because they actually do use. They invoke demons. Yes. That's what incantation does. Yes. Oh. So you're very right with looking that up and giving us that explanation, but it really it, it is much more sinister than it. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> than, right. Than that's the point. Your than at that, first, you know, it, it seems like some of this music you know that that uh gets popular seems really catchy and really you know it's got a good beat and, and and you know all the music is just right and and then the lyrics and yeah. uh and sometimes those lyrics are just man they're way out there and and sometimes they're uh you know, uh, quite revealing, too, in yeah. those ways. These incantations so. you still have when you watch a Roman Catholic uh, procession. Yes. And do you remember mm -hmm. that in the, uh, during, the f um, uh, during the forming years of the Jesuit order, when they went uh, into the new countries and they were holding their processions, they were always singing and, and, and chanting and all that stuff. Oh, and those yeah, are the incantations. Auto the yeah. auto de fe, yeah. the act of faith. Yeah. Killing the heretics. Yeah, but when they were holding processions for Mother Mary, mm. uh, the Virgin Mary or whatever, uh, you know, they were mm. always having incantations in that time also, invoking spirits to mm. possess the people who are watching these uh, processions to become part of that cult, to lure people into that cult. People mm -hmm. need to be possessed in a way, like we are being possessed today when we are watching television. True. When we are entertained, yep, we open ourselves us, uh, we open ourselves up for a f uh, unfamiliar spirit to take possession of us by entertainment. You know that I am so glad that my little one 
is not that good in English language because the music she prefers in her young age um, is uh, naja, fitted with lyrics you will not uh, publish here. So, um, on the other hand, I like to make an argument or not like to have to state a comment. That make a point. <laughs> yeah, make a point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that even in a cat Catholic website, Simon Magus uh, is presented as the first heretic of the church. <laughs> so that I find very amusing. Yeah, he, by the Roman Catholic Church itself, he is pointed out as the first heretic. And what does Ernest L. Martin do here? He points up that he is the first heretic of the true Christian church. And there's quite a difference, isn't there? Oh yeah, huge difference. I mean, I mean, they they do not draw any connections from Simon Magus to Simon Peter, obviously. Of course not. No, no of course not. Blow their cover. They yeah. don't ever speak the truth, Michael. Yeah. If they would, if if the Roman Catholic Church would teach what we are reading here in this book, tomorrow nobody would go into a Roman Catholic Church anymore. Yeah, that's why you I know, find that's a very interesting statement you just made, Jörg, if you don't mind me interrupting. No, I don't mind. That they don't ever speak the truth. Well, yes, in a spiritual sense, but in a physical sense, they do. That's the strange thing with Roman Catholicism. Their deeds never match their words. Yeah, right. So you could say they preach drinking water and themselves drinking wine. Oh, yeah, there we go. That's or a strong good drink. Yes. Mm. And that's what's it all about. That's yeah. why Jesus told us, by their fruits you will know them. Holding the wine back from the congregation, not Listen, allowing them to You can never judge anyone on what he says, but you can judge anyone on what he does. I mean, the Pope said in the plain that he agrees with the doctrine of justification of Martin Luther, right? Right. So by his words, I say, wonderful, what a wonderful man this Pope is. But then we have, we have the explanation of Bishop Schneider, Bishop Athanasio Schneider, who told in, when he was asked about this incident, that the Pope on the plane can say whatever he wants. It has no reflection on the canon, on the doctrine, on the law of the Roman Catholic Church because the Pope only speaks infallible when he speaks ex cathedra. And they already have an ex cathedra dogma of the Roman Catholic Church of the salvation, which is that one from the Council of Trent. You can never judge even a Roman Catholic by what they say, but only by what they do. By their fruits, you will know them. This is so important. This is why Jesus said that, you know? Yes. Okay, shall we continue? Please. Mm -hmm. I don't know where I was. I think somewhere here at the green sentence, right? Mm -hmm, Simon right. was the author of all heresy. From his time down to the present, those who have followed his heresy have feigned the sober philosophy of the Christians, which is celebrated among all on account of its purity of life. But they nevertheless have embraced again the superstitions of idols, which they seemed ostentatiously to have renounced and they fall down before pictures and images of even Simon himself and of the above-mentioned Helena, who was with him, that is, the images of Jupiter and Minerva. The Catholics do exactly this today, falling down at the statue of J.U. Peter and of the Virgin Mary and they venture to worship them with incense and sacrifices and libations. Also taken from the book Ecclesiastical History, Volume 2, or Chapter 2, well, Volume 2, 
chapter 13 um, part 6 and there are even kissing his statue's feet yeah and that's the, why you don't and, have and any toes anymore that you can see on that statue yeah I know but how strange is that well how strange is it to go and kiss the Pope's feet yeah of course but how strange is it to have a, a, a dead stone and to praise a dead stone and to 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 have such uh, such strange faith that uh, any dead stone can achieve something in your life yeah, so yeah, well is, michael you have to understand you have to understand that the pope is the representative of peter but the pope cannot be there 24 hours a day sitting on a throne putting out his foot for all the people to kiss his feet but he can put out the statue of Peter and they can rely on the statue of Peter and kiss his feet and by that spiritually meaning of course they are kissing the Pope's feet because ah, that's what it's all about. Ah, I get I get your point. So it's so so, so the statue is the replacement of the replacement of Jesus Christ. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but that's that's the way how that superstitious religion works. Yes, it's a dogma. Huh. The Pope calls himself the successor of Peter and they put a statue of Peter in the Basilica of St. Peter's in Rome. That statue of course is Jupiter taken from the Pantheon. We know that because we study these things. But the people who are just going into that uh, St. Peter's Basilica and wanting to worship the Pope, they don't all get an audience with the Pope they don't all get the possibility to kiss the Pope's feet. But what is it when you kiss someone's feet? It is a token of obedience. It is a token of worship. You remember the woman that washed Jesus' feet and dried them up with her hair? What was that? A sign of obedience. A sign of worship. And that's the same with that statue. So they put the statue there and let the people kiss the feet of J. Jupiter statue instead of the Pope himself, but of course it means that they are all subjects of the Pope. Yeah, I get, I, I get your point. You don't have to yell. No, I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling at the people out there <laughs> who probably don't <laughs> yeah, understand that either. <laughs> I'm not attacking you, strange. Michael. <laughs> what, what's, the, what's, the, what's the point in kissing a statue yeah. and uh, uh, in 1492, Columbus sailed the, sailed the ocean too, and um, ocean blue. Yeah, that's right. The ocean blue. Yeah, ocean two. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you got me today. Uh, you're very, you're very much awake, Brett. Oh, good. I have to point that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The but water what, helps. What's, what's, where's the difference when? Where's the difference when people are going to Rome and kissing the Pope's statue's feet? Okay, we agree on 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 this uh, on this uh, uh, name. So and and mm -hmm. and, and at the same 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 time, Col Christopher Columbus sailed with his ship Santa Maria yes. uh, into into unknown land for the for the Pope to into destroy Maryland. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <right>. yeah. <laughs> to destroy to destroy their ancient beliefs. Because they are they are praying to to stones, right. or to trees. <laughs> you see mm -hmm. my point? Yeah, it's yep. it's it's very much the same shit. It is. Yeah. Absolutely. What 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 kind of civilized country we are if we if if we are destroying other cultures which are similar to ours, which are also praying sun gods for the the. Um, the uh, in in Peru the Incas, for example, the Indians, and so on. And so, where's the difference? There's none dif no difference because also in the in the in the Roman Catholic belief system, they are praying to to any statues, as, as you pointed out, Brad, and to any graven images, to any stones. And it's a, it, it's it's almost the same. I have to look that up um, mm. as uh, as people who are uh, tossing coins. Into the Fontana uh, di Trevi uh, Fontaine, you see, yeah, to, yeah, the to fountain mm -hmm. in Rome. There, yeah, Fon right. fountain in Rome. Yeah, yeah. You see, it's it's just uh, just for me, it's 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 just uh, almost the same, because sure. uh, because okay. you don't 
yeah you don't obey to to any spiritual you say what, you you ask what is the difference okay i'm going to give you an answer for what the difference that's is that's also rhetoric rhetorical question well i'm going to answer yeah, that rhetorical rhetor question anyway because, yeah. anyway <laughs> <Anything>. <laughs> They are all sun worshippers, <coughs> S-U-N sun worshippers. You have that right. But why are the Western, uh, coming from the European civilization, invading sun uh, S-U-N sun worshippers, why are they killing all the S-U-N sun worshippers in the newfound continent of America, North and South, the Incas, the Aztecs and all the Indians, as they call them, yeah, the Native American population who were all sun sun worshippers why did they kill them off because they did not know and did not follow and did not accept the authority of the antichrist of there the we pope there we go i would have said the same thing <laughs> why the did they out of my mouth. why did they fight japan who had an emperor who called himself the emperor of the sun because he was competing with the Pope. The Japanese people were adhering to their emperor and not to the Pope of Rome. That is not possible. When you want to sun worship, you have to sun worship the true sun god, Nimrod, and his successor. And that is the Pope and nobody else. So when you are practicing sun worship, but you don't adhere and you don't follow the right, quote-unquote, righteous authority of the Pope, then you are a heretic. Anathema. Anathema. And then you are being whether converted or you die. And for them it was just easier to kill all those SUN sun worshippers on the new continent on North and South America instead of converting them to quote unquote Christianity, which is Catholicism. That's the point. Why do you think, uh, Michael, we, we fought the Vietnam War? I mean, I didn't fight them, but the Americans did. And they, up to this day, have no idea why did they go. Because they refute to read a book like Avril Manhattan's book, Vietnam, Why Did We Go? They were fighting Buddhists. But what are Buddhists in the basis? They are SUN sun worshippers. But they do not accept the authority of the Pope as does not the Eastern Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church from Greece and Russia. That's why I always make the distinction of Roman Catholicism and any else Catholicism. You get it? Yes, I got Good. it. Good. <laughs> I don't want to teach you a lesson, but I think no, no, I have no, no. to... I, I think I, I have to teach a lesson to other people because many people ask themselves this question when they are all Babylonian, when they are all SUN sun worshippers, why does the one sun worshipper kill the other? Because no. there is a difference in doctrine. And the difference in doctrine is that the Pope is the superior, the supreme leader of the SUN sun worship. He is the incarnation of Nimrod modern. And nobody else. So when you're living in Nepal and you adhere to the Dalai Lama, you accept the Dalai Lama as being God on earth, right? Mm -hmm. But when you accept the Dalai Lama as being God on earth, you don't accept the Pope being God on earth. Oh no, here comes anathema. Here is your heresy. So therefore you have to be wiped out. In Thank the you for beginning, it. it doesn't concern Satan the least little bit. Which lie you believe as long as you believe a lie and not the biblical truth. But when it comes down to the nitty gritty, he wants worship. He in his person. And that means that you have to worship his substitute on earth, which is the vicar of quote unquote Christ, the vicar of Satan. As we know, the vicarius filii dii, the 666 man of sin, son of perdition, the Pope, the head of the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan on earth. Okay, thank you for this uh, precious information. You're very much As welcome.
as as I pointed out, it was just a rhetorical question, but I wanted to like to ask Brett, uh, is it in American ling English also uh, Japan known as the country of the ascending sun? Oh, sure. The, yeah? the, okay. the country of the rising sun, sure. Of mm -hmm. the rising sun, ah, okay. Sure, mm -hmm. yeah. that's mm -hmm. right. Okay. We use the word rising, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good, I'm going to continue then in the reading. What clear and revealing statements we've just read. Eusebius is not talking about what he considers distinct heretics outside the Catholic Roman Catholic Church. He is talking about the major group in that church, which was continually adding more and more um, paganism on a large scale. He attributes these evils to the quote-unquote Christians who followed Simon Magus, who did not follow Jesus Christ as a Christian is ordered to do, but follow a man called Simon Magus and his pagan doctrine. They were so active in his day inside the church as to give him grave concern. But what happened? Did the few Roman Catholic leaders of the 4th century who abhorred outright idolatry manage to persuade the masses to, give, masses to give it up and turn away from the Simonians, now called Christians, who were the cause of it all? <laughs> the answer from history is no. The Simonian quote-unquote Christians won out. Imagery, idolatry and paganism it all became the universal church just as planned from the very beginning by Simon Magus. Or, to be more precise, by the devil who possessed Simon Magus. Can we now understand why God, through Luke, devotes a whole section of Acts to warn us of this man's origin? He was never a part of the true Church of God. N-E-V-R never. But he and his followers from clear history have succeeded in bringing in their universal Catholic religion, a pagan blend they call up to today Christian. Or quote-unquote Christian. Now, Simon Magus' counterfeit marked throughout the New Testament. <laughs> we are getting very deep in these last few seven pages, I can tell you. I got a comment. Oh, please, Brett. <laughs> you know, ever since you invited me to the Bible study with Tom Press, I've never noticed how much the... Antichrist is mentioned in the New Testament. It's just all over the place. And the reference to the 70th week of Daniel, too. You can hardly Amazing. read a verse without going back to those basics, right? Yeah, it's, it's just incredible how much it pops up. Yeah. And again, I have to break uh, a point here for my English-speaking brethren. Um, yesterday, uh, one of my German brothers made the comment that he found a translation error in the uh, in the Schlachter 2000, the German uh, Textus Receptus Bible, uh, in comparison to the King James. Again, confirming that the King James and the King James only is the true revealed word of God. Not even the Schlachter 2000 in German, which we use, is as correct as is the King James Bible. And it comes again in verse by verse by verse by verse, all over again. It is so important to have the right Bible. It is so important to have the right word of God. Because if you don't have the right word of God, you have a corrupted word of God. 
And that is not the word of God at all. That is the word of man who used the word of God for his ends. And when I hear and say the word ends, I cannot help but thinking of the Jesuit motto, the end justifies the means. Right? That's right. And every mean, every way to reach that end is good if the end is good. And if the end is for them to reach their goal, which is the goal that Satan uttered in Matthew chapter 4, then every means to achieve that goal are good. Point. There are two places in the Bible, of my knowledge, and I'm not perfect, and especially not in Bible knowledge, a Bible study, but there are two places in the Bible from where we absolutely know what Satan's goal is. The one is Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 through 14 with the direct condemnation in the following verse number 15 of his achievements. And the other is in Matthew chapter 4 where Jesus Christ after 40 days wandering through the wilderness being tempted of the devil three times when at the third point the devil clearly says and makes Jesus Christ an offer that he refused but that Simon Magus took that's the reason why we do this reading Simon Magus is the one who jumped on the offer that Satan did to him in Matthew chapter 4. Now, speaking of Matthew chapter 4 is one thing, reading it while we are doing the study is another. We see that when Jesus is tempted the third time, verse 8 of chapter 4 in Matthew, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him, speaking of Jesus, all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, in red letters, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came, came and ministered unto him. Why? Because he was forty days without food. Didn't eat, didn't drink. Try that. Forty days. I don't think you will even survive. Jesus did. So you can understand that he was physically very, very weak when Satan addressed him. And Satan did him an offer and said, If you fall down and worship me, I will give you all this. Um, is not the Pope, who according to the new book of um, P.D. Stewart that we are anxiously awaiting, Pope Francis, Lord of the World, called, is not the Pope the one who took the offer of Satan and wanted to have this kingdom and wanted to reign this kingdom and the only thing he has to do is to fall down and kiss his feet as the people do when they kiss the statue of Jupiter? Twenty minutes ago I told you that when the people go to St. Peter's Basilica and they kiss the feet of the statue of Peter they kiss actually the feet of the Pope. <sighs> The Pope is the representative of Satan. They actually kiss the feet of Satan, not knowing, having no idea. And when you go there and you tell them, they will turn onto you, because you have just cast your pearls before the swine, and they trampled on them, and they turned on them, and they rent you as Jesus Christ warned. Be very, very careful when you go into the lion's den and speak 
the truth. <sighs> yep, that's right, Yerk. Simon Magus counterfeit marked throughout the New Testament. While the book of Acts gives us the key which shows the beginnings of the false religious system under Simon Magus, is that not it does not describe its activities in any great detail. The Acts, however, performs its purpose in exposing who started the whole mess. M-E-S-S, -S, but you can also say the mass, M-A-S-S, -S, who started the whole mess, the sacrificial system all over again that Jesus Christ abolished with his deed on the cross. God leaves it to the epistles. He leaves it to Revelation and also to the Gospel of John to describe the heresy in detail. We are certainly not left in doubt concerning its abominable teachings. The chief books of Expose, I have to tell you, is what we are dealing with next time when we come to the 15th reading of this wonderful book, Simon Peter versus Simon Magus, or Simon Peter meets the competition. The Apostle Peter never was in Rome. Who is Simon Magus? What are the basis of Simonism that we see today all over the world and we call it Roman Catholicism? In the next part we will speak of the chief books of Expose. I am sorry, we have almost reached an hour and it was an intense reading and we are going to continue next time with this. And I'm going to leave some closing remarks. First to my German friend Michael and then to Brett over there in the United States. Please, brothers. Yeah, thank you for this very informative lecture. Um, in the meantime, I have also looked up uh, as there were any other mentioned events in the Bible which relates to people like Simon Magus and it uh, came to my mind that there was actually in the second book of Moses, chapter 7, verse 11, which reads, Then Pharaoh also called the wise man and the sorcerers. Now, the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. And verse 12 is also very interesting because it goes like this. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. So, the opposite sorcerers in the Old Testament, in the second book of Moses, are called like serpents, so which are also known as the dragons or servants of the devil, of Satan. And so I think that's a very much, uh, yeah, very much interesting um, background information that there were all ways sorcerers mentioned in the Bible, not only only Simon Magus, but for example, second book of Moses, and also I think in Acts 13 there was a, a bar Jesus, called, a, a sorcerer called Bar Jesus, which also was uh, in opposition to Peter and Paul. So that's that's the one thing. On the other hand, um, I came across that uh, there even was or is. Um, a computer game like uh, called Simon the Sorcerer, which uh, has is a point-and-click adventure game developed and published by AdventureSoft in 1993 for Amiga and MS-DOS. So it's very old, <laughs> old, old of course. Really? But uh, but you see, it's it's um, everything which relates to sorcery is very fascinating to to the average John Doe, and. Um, yeah, I like to I like to to to, to add that uh, to this lecture, and there is so much so much other stuff which I could point out. For example, that uh, in the Harry Potter movies, um, there is uh, some episode or some some movie called Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. <laughs> so that th these were the small. 
uh, background informations I would like to share. And that's, these are also my closing comments. Okay, I just have to go a little bit before I leave uh, Brett with his closing comments. I just have to go a little bit into the correct understanding of uh, the second book of Moses, chapter 7, you said it was? Exodus yeah. chapter 7, which was yeah. the verse that you were just reading? At 11 and 12. 11 and 12. <clears throat> when Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. So this is what God says to Moses. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called his wise men and the sorcerers, as you correctly said, Mm -hmm. Now the magicians of Egypt, magicians, mm -hmm. they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became certain. So the rods became certain, not the people, okay? okay. But mm -hmm. Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. So this is just to prove that there is only one true God with real power, and all the other quote-unquote demigods don't have any power at all, but use magic, use tricks on the people. The rods that the magicians of the pharaoh threw on the ground became quote-unquote serpents, but when it came down to the nitty-gritty, only the serpent of the rod that Aaron and Moses threw on the ground were real serpents, and they devoured or swallowed up the other rods. That's the point. Mm -hmm. The point okay. is... Thank the point is that there is only one true God who can perform real miracles. And these rods that were thrown by the magicians and the sorcerers of the Pharaoh were just magic tricks. They were not real power. But the rod that Aaron and Moses threw on the ground and became a serpent. That was a real serpent, and that by that it had the power to devour the serpents the other guys threw around. This was to show what real power is, and that with this fake magic, as today with this fake science, you don't reach anything. And that's the point that wanted to be made here in Exodus. So I'm sorry I had to correct you here. No, it's, it's, it's nice it's that you okay. brought that it's, point it's very, up. It's, it's, it's very, very, very interesting because you see, I was uh, stumbling across this fact because also I read um, they did in like manner with their enchantments. So they are also praying to some kind of semi god, you see. And so, so that, that, that goes in line with our previous um, uh, conversation mm -hmm. in regards of, of, of the incantations. Uh, yeah, correctly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I know what you were referring to, but the point is Moses and Aaron did not do any enchant, uh, enchantments. They mm -hmm. did not do any incantations. They only took the rods and threw them on the ground and they became serpents because God told them that was what he would do. Mm -hmm. But the magicians, the sorcerers of the Pharaoh, they have to use enchantments because they have to invoke demons. Yes, to get helpful. into yeah. the rods to become the serpents, and that is something that the true God of course does not need. Mm -hmm. So that's why Moses and Aaron did not use incantations, and of course the sorcerers and magicians of the Pharaoh of Egypt they did. Absolutely. Interesting point to make to the close of this. Do you want to add something, Michael? Oh, I think I'm I'm run out of arguments. <laughs> I'm running out of arguments. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I leave a closing remark then for Brother Brett in the United States. Oh, yes. Very, very interesting points you bring up, Michael. And, you know, I was doing the same kind of studies along the word sorcery and all of the different meanings behind, you know, like this word incantation I just brought up and, you know, fascination, all these things, uh, charming, you know, all of these different words have a purpose, like and we can go right back to this um, this uh, example that uh, it's really God's righteousness that uh, in the book of Exodus, just as you said, it, it's it's God's righteousness 
that prevails over everything. So that's the point. We want to be seated in, in his righteousness, in his word, in his way. Otherwise, um, we're in big trouble. So that's uh, it's really good to sit down and study these things and, and you know, understand the words and, and get a deeper meaning behind, you know. Oh, I'm a musician, so, you know, I've, I've done a lot of songs and lyrics and things like that. So I feel like I have some responsibility to get a better idea of uh, what I'm really tapping into when I get on a stage and, and start singing in front of an audience. Because not many people can do that, by the way. Uh, I, I think I think that stage also is a very dangerous thing to go onto a stage because then um, you exalt yourself above the others, above the audition, uh, the the uh, the audience. Sorry, and um, so they they worship you. If you if you see a rock concert, uh, the the people on on the stage are presented in bright light, like they were gods, like they were you see Luciferian or something, and all the people. All the people in 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 the audience are, uh, uh, yeah, putting their hands in the air and 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 praise them. You see, it's 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 stardom. Okay, it's of of course stardom comes from the stars. Uh, I, no, I I don't have to 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 point all out. I think <laughs> it take, takes too long. Well, but, you get uh, my point. You get. I, my I get point you. I is... get your point, and I also got something I I I did for for I have I have. For I don't I don't go to do rock concerts anymore I know, but I'm I just know. saying I just that. wanted, to, <laughs> I just wanted to, to to fill in this information so well sorry, it's true wanted... you know it, it there is a lot of of problems in our uh so-called society because of these um these traditions that we you know get hooked into doing you know going to these concerts and and giving our energy to these uh silly songs and things like this and these silly artists and things like that and um, you know certainly there is a lot of inequality there I can't argue with that at all and I don't agree with the way things are done and, and I don't participate in it any, anymore but still uh, you know it just lends more credibility to the Bible in the end because it's uh, it's God's will that does everything. Our will just is really not, you know. It 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 only uh, you know we only uh, exalt the uh, principles of darkness if we start praising ourselves for the wrong reasons. Yeah, that's what I want to say. And that's a really bad place to be. And I've seen a lot of people. Uh, you know, die from doing things like that. So, in my life, you know, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I, I think you see, you see, if you are if you are singing any uh, non-Christian contents or satanic contents, you see, it's it's also a form of enchantment. If you're a rock star, what, what 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 you're doing? If you're M Eminem or, or so, someone else, what are you doing the 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 entire time? You're, you're you're praising your devil. Yeah, you see, and 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 so um, it's 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 quite quite interesting to to look up for the lyric, lyrics of the song, because it's often so that you are so much fascinated by the rhythm as 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 you were mentioned and the beat and and everything on top of this, but you don't uh, you only get the lyrics in your unconsciousness. Consciousness or, or in your yeah, in the conscience, yeah, in the conscience, yeah, in the conscience, mind, yeah. and 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 so you are being being, uh, yeah, swept away with that because yeah, you like to foot stomp, you like to clap your hands, and everything's fine. You're driving your car and blah blah blah, and uh, yeah, there are so many satanic things in your mind at the same time. Yeah, but you're not not a, you're aware of mostly most of the time. Oh, it's true. But. I like sure. I like to I like to add some point, Brett, if you, if I may say so, because I just found a cross reference to the sorcerers in Egypt, mm -hmm. uh, because there is also a chapter in the New Testament in the second uh, book of Timothy, chapter three, verse eight, where uh, two of the sorcerers were actually named. 
and the the verse goes like now as Janice I spell J A N N E S and Jambres J A M B R E S oh, yeah. M-B-R-E-S, which stood Moses so do these also resist the truth men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith and you see it's it's just uh, very interesting if you look up the Kim James Bible and I think that's the most uh, an interesting effect of the King James Bible online because you and also of of the software called eSort because you can look for cross references and it's uh, as you as you mentioned before it's so much uh, in depth uh, analysis uh, and and so much content in the Bible it's 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 not possible I think for for a human being to have extract to to extract uh, all the information which is enlisted in the bible okay yeah that's, that's true that's true and but the the fact is the more that we dig into it the more we can learn from what the bible's trying to tell us that's the important part mm. and especially when we know we're in the wrong you know we're not seated in the proper principles because you know all these horrible things are happening to us and they keep happening because we repeat what we, you know, just have this tendency to just repeat over and over and over and over the same thing. I mean, that music is a perfect example of that because you're sitting there playing the same chords all the time. And then you're adding, you know, when you're doing a recording session, you write songs and things like that. You're just adding things on top of what you've already done, what you've already produced. So, mm-hmm. you know... Yeah, yeah, that's I, what I'm getting to is that there are principles behind the the whole thing and and when you fall into the trap of oh I want to go out and perform my songs you know anyway we could go on for hours on this and I don't want to do that we could we could <laughs> I could I could add another comment but uh, I'm afraid that we are running out of time yeah this is not meant to be a discussion on yeah. on that subject right now, but could easily turn into that, right, Eric? <laughs> yeah, it could, but we could also do that for another time when we do that subject instead of the subject that we are dealing with right now with reading the but book. But it does of, relate, though, Eric, because it is sorcery. Uh, everything is related to that uh, kind, it of, is. kind of subject. Everything is related to the Bible in the end, Brett and Michael. It and sure I think is. that is what we should not never lose sight of, because that's what the devil wants us to do. Lose right. sight of the Bible, lose sight of the Word of God, right. which is the only authority in this world after which we should act. As Martin Luther said when he was standing there in, uh, in Worms, um, that he said, I cannot go against my conscience, because God is the master of my conscience, and it is not safe nor healthy to go against God. And that's what we should remember, and that's what we should always put in our hearts. And that's what I want to put into your hearts, dear listener and viewer of this video. First of all, to go to the Word of God. Study the Word of God. Make yourself familiar with the Word of God. Make yourself familiar with the one who created you, with the one without whom you would not be on this earth. It is not your Uh, biological father and mother that created you they were just vessels to bring you in this world but it is God the invisible father who is in heaven who Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 4 who you should worship and who you should obey only don't ever forget that go back to the Bible go back to the basics you know and then from there go on and learn the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that's the wisdom you want to have. That's not Moses, but that's the wisdom of the Word of God. Until next time, Maranatha. Heart, there is no 